Welcome everyone to the new Fly Fisher. I'm your host Bill Spicer. On today's show we continue the incredible salmon fishing in one of Canada's most beautiful areas, Ontario's North Country. We'll discuss the equipment, the flies, the technique and everything needed to be successful with these feisty pink salmon. This promises to be an exciting show so stay with us, we'll be right back. On today's show, the new fly fisher crew are guests of Nipigon River Adventures, located just north of Thunder Bay in the town of Red Rock, Ontario. The area offers spectacular beauty, wildlife, and some of the best fishing I've ever had in my life. My guide for today is Jeff Lawrence, owner of Castaway Guide Service. Jeff's many years of experience and his intimate knowledge of the rivers in the area will assure me of a successful day. In the Red Rock and Nipigon areas, other than the big river, we have lots of choices uh, for fishing. Uh, starting in the west, we have the Wolf River, the Black Sturgeon River, then the big river, the Nipigon. Then beyond that, we have the Jack Pine River and the Cypress, and all five rivers get a phenomenal steelhead run in the spring. Uh, they have resident rainbows and brook trout in them all year round. And in the fall, starting with Chinook salmon, to the pink salmon, to the coho salmon come into these rivers. And then later on, the steelhead will come into these rivers. Okay, got one, fish on. Can you get up on the reel? Get him back here. And like I say, oh, he hit fish one that time. All males for some reason. But I'm not arguing with that. The hens are what we want to leave alone. Take the males, there's lots of them. Stay away from the, the reds, and what I mean by a red is uh, the spawning bags where you actually see the fish flopping on the nest and that, uh, leave them alone, fish behind everything, and you'll have no problem taking fish. You don't have to take the ones that are on the beds. Salmon will do that. You have to really be careful. They, they like to roll and they try to roll the line around them and, that, and you can lose a fish that way. Especially the big Chinooks. They'll do that all the time. See if I can tail them without going into the water. Such an effective method of taking the fish Swinging flies works for steelhead, resident rainbow trout, brown trout, any of the salmonoids. 
They use it solely in the East Coast for Atlantic salmon, just swinging flies. So it's a really, really effective method of taking fish. And another good male. There we go. Now, on right there. And we'll let him go. One more last look at him. Just a wonderful fish. Oh, look at him go, look at him go. The Nipigon region, along with the tributaries that flow into the north shore of Lake Superior, are a natural visitor destination any time of the year. Nestled against the backdrop of dramatic landscapes, such as high cliffs, beautiful lakes and lush forests, the region has a wealth of activities to offer all ages, the likes of which cannot be found anywhere else in the world. Other activities such as hiking, sailing, kayaking, and snowmobiling are available in the area. The Nipigon River is the largest tributary to Lake Superior and famous for offering a century of world-class fishing. The world record speckled trout was caught here in 1916 by Dr. J.W. Cook. The fish was a whopping 14 and a half pounds. While visiting the area, we stayed in the Quebec Lodge, which was built in 1937. A beautiful building constructed of logs cut in the area, with a huge stone fireplace that dominates the living room and provides a cozy atmosphere. While I was there, I spoke with Ray Rivard, owner of Nipigon River Adventures. The Quebec Lodge is located within about five minutes of the town of Red Rock. Um, population of about 1,100. Nipigon is a couple thousand people and it's uh, 10 minutes away. The, the area is beautiful and the people are willing to work with, with one another and so our business has been able to work very nicely with um, guiding people and people that provide other, other services, uh, be it hiking, biking, photography, kayaking, sailing. So there's a number of opportunities. You, I'm not saying that the fishing isn't great because it is great, but there are other things to do too. The equipment you're going to need when you come up to Nipigon River Adventures is a, a variety of rods from sizes 5 weight up through 9 weight. Uh, reason being is uh, if you're going to target just pink salmon, a number 5 weight will work. If you're going to go on to the big river and go into the big uh, Chinook salmon, you're going to need a 9 weight. Uh, for the most part on today's show, I used a floating line. You don't need anything else. Uh, this particular line is called a nymph line and it has a bright orange section on the tip and it's, it's been very helpful in determining when I get a strike. Uh, the leaders, nine foot tapered standard trout leader down to about a 4X. Now, you should bring along some sinking leaders or a sink tip line for when you're on the bigger waters and possibly even a full sinking line if you get into extremely deep water. Uh, but for the most part, for the pinks and what we're doing today, a number five weight will be fine. In the case of what I have in my hand right now, I have a 10 foot number seven weight because we heard there was some steelhead in the river and a number five weight would have been a little light for them if I had a, happened to get one. So I like a 10 foot number seven. Uh, large arbor wheel, uh, reels, um, salmon and steelhead have this real habit of running directly towards you so you're gonna to have to be able to pick up line at a fast rate. A good drag system on your reel will help. Uh, as far as the bigger fish, nice and smooth, your chances of getting them are much higher. So there's, in a nutshell, is the equipment that you're gonna need. I do have one. <laughs> I thought it was snagged. Now one of the worst things you can do when fighting a fish is this, holding on to your blank like that. This isn't a very big fish, but if it was a larger fish, all the stress on the rod goes to where my fingers are. It'll likely break there or will break later there. Right in the top of the mouth there. There we go.
There we go. Now today I started off uh, dead drifting uh, some egg patterns, but because the conditions are so low and the water so clear, I had to uh, stay away from the fish, and so dead drifting wasn't really an option today. So I had to think about swinging flies, and one of the best techniques you can steelhead with is swinging flies. But I tried some larger flies, they didn't work so well because it spooked the fish. So I decided to go with beadhead hare's ears and beadhead pheasant tails, and they seemed to work. Uh, we didn't add any split shot other than when I, I ran out of bead heads itself and had to go with a regular hare's ear, a regular uh, pheasant tail, I used a little piece of split shot to get it down. So here I got some bead head pheasant tails here. I have a woolly worm. I tried, I took a couple of fish on the woolly worm, but it was still a little bit large, the, the woolly worm itself. It's about a size 10 long, and it was a little large. It was spooking the fish. And then the hottest fly that I had today was the bead head pheasant tail itself. It had just the right amount of weight so that when I casted it out, it sunk down enough, it didn't hang up in the bottom all the time, and swung right in front of the fish's face. So this seemed to be the hot fly today. Uh, I had very, very good success with it, and uh, all around, it's a great fly. Pheasant tails, uh, for most trout fishermen, they know what a pheasant tail is, and it's a hot fly everywhere. So. Here's the recipe for the bead head pheasant tail. The hook is a Mustad 9671 in sizes 10 through 16. The tail, four to six pheasant tail fibers. The rib is gold wire. The thorax is peacock hurl. The wing case is pheasant tail fibers and the head a tungsten bead. And when I first got here, I seen we had a lot, of, a lot of fish in front of me. And I had two split shot on. Well, I tried, I knew I'd have to take off the indicator because of the shallow water, it spooks the fish. But uh, what I didn't realize was there wasn't quite enough flow. Every time I cast it out, it would sink right to the bottom. I wasn't getting a proper drift. So I pulled off both uh, split shot and had a, just a fly on itself. Well, that was riding along the top and the fish weren't rising. So I got a bead head pheasant tail, and that seemed to be just enough weight to get it under the surface and swing in front of the, the fish, and the, the aggressive ones only are the ones that's taking it. But it, it's what I had to do, experiment constantly. I'm always changing weight. That's one, one of the successes I've had by always adapting and changing your weight. That's what you gotta do. You can't stay with one weight the whole time. So I took it off, I went with this uh, small bead head. That seemed to be enough, I'm catching fish. The line just moved a little bit in an unnatural manner. That's when I struck. Now for the beginners that are fly fishing that uh, are getting to the first fish and they don't quite know what to do, how to, how to fight these fish, I want you to notice a couple of things. One, I feel the line with my finger. I use that kind of like a drag and I can tell when the fish is gonna run. Anytime the fish wants to run, I let it go. If it wants to pull some line out, I let it go. If it comes my way, I wind down, I pump up with my, with my arm, like so. Now, if they get stuck in one spot, there's a couple of things you can do. You can do that to the line, it's like a guitar string. That little tweak goes right down into their jaws, right down the line into their jaw and they'll move. Or, apply a little side pressure. Fish are used to moving straight forward, so if you add side pressure, they're not used to fighting it that way. So a little side pressure generally gets them to move where you want them to. Confuse them, both sides. And if you can wind in like I am, wind in. If this fish decides it wants to run, I allow a little line to, to run. The males are the aggressive ones. These are the ones I'd rather target. Slow down, there we go. Nice small male pink salmon.
and away it goes. During the fall, most of your fishing will be in areas where you would find your steelhead in the spring, um, looking for seams, current breaks, undercut banks, in front or below big rock outcroppings or boulders, uh, long, narrow, slow-moving tailouts. That's where the fish are going to hold. Uh, some of the fish will be up along the gravel where they're spawning, and those are what we call the reds. The fish will be, there will be fish behind them, either eating the eggs that are coming out of the nest or awaiting their turn to go in and to spawn. Don't target the reds. Those are the fish that are uh, trying to spawn and keep the, the fish populations alive in the rivers. Um, target the areas behind them. There's fish there. And if you target them, you'll get them. Okay, I just, I just got another fish here, and what I had to do, the water's skinny, and that what I mean by that, it's low and it's very, very clear. So I had to get rid of my indicator. I was trying an indicator here, the fish were moving, so I have a specialty line on, and I'll show you in a minute here uh, what kind of line it is. It's called a nymphing line. The end of the line is bright orange, and it doesn't seem to be bothering the fish, so I put that on, and a weighted fly with no other split shot. So this, this is just a different way of nymphing. And it's for these conditions where the water is so, so clear. Again, another, another fresh male here. One more little look. And he's just about ready, and away he goes. Anybody that watches our show on a regular basis knows that uh, I advocate the use of indicators uh, most of the time. But there is times when you run into conditions that an indicator is detrimental and sometimes even spooks the fish, which is uh, the situation I'm running into today. I have very low and very clear water. So I had to remove my actual um, indicator, but uh, what I've got here is a new line that's out. It's called a nymph line. And as you can see, I'll get both, both parts here. The last foot to a foot and a half is fluorescent orange. This has been huge for me today dealing with these low water conditions. I don't have to use an actual indicator. All I do is watch the end of my line. And if it twitches or moves in any way unnatural, I've been setting the hook. So this is something you might want to check out. Go to your local dealer and, and say you want a nymphing line and they'll, tell, they'll know what you're talking about. It's got the indicator built right on the line. When using these indicator lines, all you're going to see is an unnatural movement of the end of the line, like so. Just like a little movement like that, and that's your hit. It's very subtle. If you see that, strike. Here we go. Oh, I got a tangle here. Get a tangle like that, you gotta put it in your fingers for a minute. Had a tangle on my reel, now get it right back on the reel. It's always best to, to, to fight off your reel. You'll see some fly fishermen fight with the line. That's okay if you got smaller fish like this, you can fight off the line. A bigger fish, if they take a big run on you, will sometimes get away. Uh, you need to control your line at all times. Is it line management? Away he goes. 
<laughs> the setup we're using today is a floating line to a 9 foot leader tapered down to 4x fluorocarbon tippet and attached to that the weighted fly. Oh yeah, oh yeah, good fish. Oh, I, you know what I think? I think for the, I got my first female. Yeah, it's a hen, which is good. I've got a whole bunch of males, but only one hen. Hey, get Jeff to come down here and tail this fish, be real gentle with her. She's an important resource here. Okay. And, yeah, right on the side of the jaw there. Let's get her out there real quick. Oh, all right, just lower her down, lower her down. And away she goes. <laughs> Well, I hope you enjoyed today's show and make the North Country one of your next fishing trips. I want to thank Jeff Bill. for guiding me today. My it was pleasure, Bill. A wonderful, wonderful day. I want to thank Ray Rivard at uh, Nipigon uh, River Adventures for all the hospitality and the wonderful food. Uh, for more information on this show and others in our series, visit us on the web at thenewflyfisher.com. From all of us here at the New Fly Fisher, thanks for joining us. Tight lines, and we'll see you next time.